I just want to make these 45 minutes the best 45 minutes in continuing education of your life. So it's just an amazing combination of my Kentucky accent. And, you know, I don't have a Kentucky accent, but I live in Kentucky for a long time. But I believe that I sound like Kentucky, but not really. So um, it is really a pleasure for me to come this afternoon to talk about radiation safety in children. Um, it will take me about 45 minutes. I will tell you a little bit about me in a minute. So you know this guy with this weird accent, what he does for a living. And, uh, and also I will tell you a little bit about why my interest in radiation safety in children, which is really my life. I, um, I go everywhere, and what I said everywhere is all around the world, about radiation safety in pediatric patients. I'm a pediatric dentist and I am a practicing pediatric dentist in Indianapolis and uh, it's just because you know in pediatric dentistry we use radiation so I'm always concerned about maybe I'm taking too many radiographs I'm taking the correct number of radiographs and as you can imagine working with the little ones they are more radio sensitive than adults. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here talking about radiation safety in the little ones. Um, this is coming very often these days. One more thing, doctor. No x-rays, please. And I will tell you why. Why patients in this day, they will come with the idea, please, no more x-rays. And as a pediatric dentist, and even, you know, a general dentist, a family dentist, in these days, more often than never before, patients and parents are going to look at your eyes and say, hey, just stop one minute. Are you going to take one more radiograph? Do I really need it? And sometimes it's difficult because moms and dads, parents, patients, sometimes they get the wrong information. And I will show you in a few minutes from where. And why in these days that idea of taking a lot of x-rays could be a problem. So that's me. If someday you want to send me an email, that's my email. Um, so my question is, if this is true, taking x-rays is something really bad, I'm going to die if I continue to get radiation. So I will try to answer this question in the next 45 minutes. This is how I'm going to divide my seminar. I will talk a little bit about why we care about radiation in children. You can change children from adults. So this is not exclusively of the little ones. It could be anybody. I am a patient. You are a patient. Then I will talk a little bit about the guidelines of prescription. How often we're supposed to take a panoramic film? How often we're supposed to take a periodical? Then, just will tell you two or three slides about are we overexposing children? And finally, a couple of final remarks and questions. I have a couple of disclaimers. Um, I am proud sponsor by Air Techniques. And I will tell you, I have a deeply appreciation for air techniques, and in a few minutes I will tell you why. Uh, if you see any picture from any patient, I always ask mom and dad if I can play the picture in my PowerPoint. This is not, okay. And if I use any picture, I got the picture from my website that I can use the picture for a public presentation. So I'm going to divide my presentation in, I will give you an introduction. I don't want you to take a nap, but I will give you two slides of radiation biology. What you're supposed to know, when you click the button, you maybe, you don't, you don't smell, you don't feel, but believe it or not, when you press the button, x-rays are going from the x-ray head to your patient. You never will have a patient who will tell you, you know, doc, feel great. All these x-rays going to my, you don't feel it. But the reality is, x-rays are true. They exist. We need it. But I will tell you a little bit about radiation biology. What is the truth about x-ray hitting my body? Then, a little bit about dosimetry, how we measure radiation. 
the key principles of radiation protection, justification for the imaging. I'm going to talk briefly about digital imaging and about the handheld. If you walk around here, you will see several options that you can carry the x-ray with you. And I get the question all the time, is it safe to use? What is the amount of radiation that will get back to me? We are going to talk about that. And finally, a little bit about risk. So, my own experience as a pediatric dentist, I will tell you that the frustration starts, I used to, you know, in the old days, regular films, you know, the ones that you used to go to the dark room, wait 10 minutes, and then looking at the radiograph, and if the radiograph was not ideal quality, you will be back to the patient. And, and then when I start to use digital radiology, my frustration went up, especially working with children. A lot of retakes, a lot of retakes. My assistant will come to me and say, hey, Dr. J, look at this film. And the film will be concut, or the film will be elongated. So my own experience, started with a lot of frustration, trying to find what is the best way to take radiographs, digital radiographs, in a dental office without taking a lot. Because as like, you can imagine, if you take a lot of radiographs, that is more radiation for the patient. I need to say that there is a national campaign about radiation safer in children. The name is Image Gently. This is coming from physicians. It's not coming from dentists. It's pediatric radiologists that they are concerned about radiation in children. So I always, you know, when a mom or a dad wants to know a little bit more about radiation in the dental office, I always tell the parents, go to the website, Image Gently, you click dental, and then you can download this brochure. I wrote that brochure about seven years ago. What parents should know about dental x-rays and children? So rather than spend 20 minutes talking with the parents, you just print this and then you can just give to the parents. Dental x-rays for children, what parents should know about that? It's an amazing resource. It's an amazing resource because it's only two pages and it explains to the parents what is the meaning of an x-ray, what is the meaning of a bite wing, what is the meaning of a phosphor or plate, what is the meaning of a panoramic film. So it's a nice resource. So this lecture is about the middle. On one side, radiation safety, that's the title of the lecture. On the other side, I need a panoramic film. So the idea is not to be against radiation. If I'm walking around here, and if I see x-rays walking, I will run and give a hug, because I love radiation. So my intention is not to sell you the idea, don't use radiation. The opposite, you need to use it. It's just to use it when it's justified. So what we are going to try to work is that midpoint between taking a lot of taking a lot of X-rays or taking the X-ray that we need. Look at this girl. This girl is a four-year-old. I took this picture. I was working in my hospital and I saw this girl walking with the dental assistant. And I I asked the assistant to come and I said, how old is the girl? And she told me, Dr. J, she's only four. So my next question is, why you are taking a panoramic film in a four-year-old? The answer was, I don't know. So I called the resident or the doctor who prescribed that. He came to me and looked and said, well, I just want to know if all the teeth are present. And I said, that's not a good justification. <laughs> well, her behavior was not the best. So I want to look for interproximal decay. And I said, that's not a good answer. So the point is, and I'm not against radiation, the point is, that's probably not the ideal age to take a panoramic film. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes what's supposed to be that perfect age to take a panoramic film. So this lecture loves radiology. This seminar is not against radiation. 
radiology is part of the diagnosis. So I will be an absolutely, I mean, I never will be here saying, don't take x-rays. The opposite. We need to take it. Now, if you, if you think, why in these days the public, patients, why they know a little bit more about radiation? from where they are getting all this information. I will show you four examples. Number one, The Economist. The Economist is a magazine, nothing related with dentistry. There are seven articles in the last five years about little and not often clips. Basically, what they are saying is, we dentists, we take a lot of radiographs. So if I am a dad or a patient and I look at that, I will get the idea that my doctor maybe is taking more radiographs than he really needs. WebMD, dental x-rays linked to brain tumors. ABC News, early dental x-rays linked to brain tumors. The New York Times, radiation worries for children in dental chairs. CNN, are dental x-rays dangerous? So, I just gave you four examples that we, general public, and the people outside the dental office, they are getting all this information that unfortunately is not very well supported, that your dentist is taking more x-rays than he really needs. And sometimes it's difficult to tell the patient that that's maybe not the case. So, why this idea that x-rays may be connected with brain tumors? I will show you from where. So you will see how sometimes good signs can be taken in the wrong direction. So there is an article published about five years ago, and the article actually said that if you have twice a year biguins, then you can increase the risk of meningiomas. I will tell you what they did. It. They called patients with diagnosis of meningiomas. They called and they called patients without diagnosis of meningiomas. Meningiomas is a brain tumor and it's a benign tumor, but it's in the control tower. So they asked, "Could you please remember how many panoramic films you have from zero to ten, ten to twenty? How many bite wings? I don't have any clue." How many panoramic films, how many bite wounds? That's exactly what they did. With a big problem, recall bites. Trying to remember something that happened in the past. And interesting, this article was published in Cancer Research, which is a very well-known, good reputation journal. And patients, if all the patients will go to this, they will get the idea that if you get migraines on one or more occasion per year, then you are going to increase the risk of having brain tumors. If you get a panoramic film under the age of 10, then you increase the risk of a brain tumor. But this article came with a big problem, recall bites, asking people to remember, which as you can imagine, asking people to remember is extremely difficult. If you ask me my lunch last night, or if you ask me my breakfast three days ago, no idea. But that's exactly what they did. So one of the problems of this article is to recall something that happened more than 50 years ago. Now, is the concern about radiation and cancer in the US is justified? Well, we believe that about 1.5% to 2% of all the cancers in our country, they may well be connected with radiation, but not dental radiation. Medical radiation, this is the number of CTs in 1993, and this is the number of CTs in 2006. We are using radiation a lot, a lot in medicine, and the amount of radiation in the medical field, as you can imagine, is a lot higher. where you are in terms of radiation. There are two extremes. I don't care. Just 
I don't care. You can take 25 radiographs in a day, I don't care. Or you are in the other extreme, don't take radiographs. The idea is to be in the middle. I'm always very afraid that sometimes, especially for those who are on the extreme, I don't care. Sometimes people will say, if you fly from Seattle to Miami and you look all the time through the window, then you are going to increase the amount. That is equivalent to having a panoramic film, which is not true. If I'm in a plane and I look all the time through the window, five hours is not the same radiation that a panoramic film. The panoramic film is still higher. So if you are in the extreme of, I don't care, you need to be careful with this kind of example. If you are walking outside for five minutes, that's the same that a camping city. That's not true. If you walk outside for 20 minutes, that's the same that a panoramic film. That's not true. So I am always a little bit concerned about using this example that they are not true. And sometimes you hear this everywhere. Oh, no worries. One panoramic film walking outside 10 minutes. That's not true. And I will tell you in a minute why that is not true. So I hope that you don't live in nobody cares. So we need to balance. That's the idea. And one of the things that I love about Earthquake, not just only the products are just amazing, is part of the balance comes with using products who are going to minimize as much as you can the retakes. And we are going to talk about that in a minute. So the idea is to balance. You don't want to be, I don't care about radiation. You don't want to be on the other side. Oh, you know what? No x-rays. You want to be in the middle. So I hope that you care. In these days, uh, I'm sorry, I need to cover something. OK. In these days, when you go to TCA, you know, when you are at any airport in the country, you know, you pass through this door, or you put your hands up, we live in a planet full of radiation. Interesting enough, when you go through any airport in the country, and you go through the one that you put your hands up and moves around you, that is no radiation. It doesn't use radiation. The one that uses radiation is the door. The one that you, ah, and then you go back and you take your belt, ah, and then you go back and you take. So you will need to go about 2,000 times back and forward to be the, exactly the same amount of radiation that a chest x-ray. But it's radiation. So we live in a world that this is a picture from the border between Mexico and the US in San Diego. Every time that a car crosses the border, a huge x-ray machine will irradiate the whole car to look for people hiding in the back, or to look for narcotics, or to look for guns. And the officer is not going to say how many people is hiding in the back, let me do the HIPAA, and let me do the consent. We live in a planet where radiation is around us, period. So you will need to go about 2,000 times to be about the same radiation that a chase x-ray, going to the earth, earth, but the one that you put your hands up, that is not radiation. Interesting, no? So, and this is the big x-ray machine, and you can see this, this family said thank you, and they didn't know that the whole car just passed through a big x-ray machine. So we live in a planet that x-ray is around us. I will just go because I want, okay. So this is the part of the lecture that you can, you know, it's going to take me only three slides. I just want to tell you a little bit about radiation biology because I want you to understand what is the truth about x-rays. So it will take me three slides. So the basic concepts of radiation biology. I know sometimes when I talk about that to my students, that's the things. Here we go again, Yep is talking about radiation biology. But I will keep it easy. So radiation biology is basically what happened in my body as a human when I'm hidden by x-rays. That's radiation biology. Believe it or not, 
is true. When you are in the dental office and they take an x-ray, ah, x-rays are going through your face and they are going to affect the tissues. They can modify biological molecules. And if you get several times, several times, then they can produce some changes in the tissues who are heated by x-rays. X-rays belong to the electromagnetic radiation. They have a great penetrating power. We know that. X-rays can go through my face. We know that. That's, that's easy. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum, this is not a seminar about physics. But let me tell you something that is interesting. X-rays are here. All these radiation types are part of the electromagnetic radiation. The difference between radio waves, microwaves, X-rays, and gamma rays is the wavelength. So infrared is like a X-rays. It's like that. But it's hard to believe next to the X-rays, what is next to the X-rays? Gamma rays. Do you know gamma rays are used for what? Killing cancer. Radiation therapy. That's what they use to kill tumors. Just to give you an idea that, yes, X-rays are innocent. I mean, they are not bad. But the neighbor, just the next one, is also radiation and has the ability to kill cells. Now, x-rays in the dose that we use it is not going to kill cells, but just to understand that x-rays belong to all these sources of energy. I, this is a good name for a pet. If you want to adopt a new dog, you can name the dog Camto. But listen to this. Every time that you take an x-ray, some of the x-rays are going to have something that we call Campton effect. What is the Campton effect? 30% of the x-rays who hit your face, they bounce back. They bounce back. They don't go through the patient. That's the reason that even with the thyroid color, some x-rays will hit the thyroid. 30%, th that's a lot. It's like a ping pong ball. You hit that to the wall and some of the ping pong walls, the ping pong balls will come back. 30% of the x-rays they back to you. All back around the area. That's pretty high. And every time that you 30% will come back to you. Well, you need to be away, I hope, but they bounce back. So that's the Campton scatter which is about 30% of the scattered forms formed through a dental x-ray exposure with exit the patient head. Okay, now, if you are thinking, well, who cares about radiation? Nothing in my neck or in my head is susceptible to radiation. We have something very susceptible to radiation in head and neck. We have the thyroid gland. That's the most susceptible cells that we have in head and neck. So we have a target here that we want to keep it in a good shape. So I will show you something in the next slide. In the US, in 2014, 232,000 cases of breast cancer were diagnosed in a year. 233,000 cases of prostate cancer, 62,000 cases of thyroid cancer. So less thyroid cancer than breast cancer or prostate cancer. But the next slide, nobody knows why. I will show you the next slide that you are going to look and say why. So thyroid cancer is not the number one. The number one, breast, lung, prostate, but this is the number of thyroid cancer in 1975 and the number of thyroid cancers in 2013. Thyroid cancer is the fastest growing cancer in the US. We see more cases of thyroid cancer in these days than never before. 
Now, I am not saying that we are seeing more cases of thyroid cancer because they the like face. Of course not. But it's maybe part of the game. We really don't know. In the next five years, everybody sitting here, you are going to meet with somebody diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Maybe related with cell phones, maybe related with eating tacos, maybe related with driving, maybe related with using Uber, maybe related, who knows? But that's the reason that at the end, I will tell you what you can do in your practice to minimize as much as you can the amount of radiation. Not to stop to use it, but to be more conscious about using radiation. We measure radiation, just one slide. We measure radiation in terms of sieverts. That's the unit. In the same way that weight is kilos or pounds, distance, miles, volume, liters, gallons, radiation is in sieverts. That's the unit. Beautiful name for your next dog. 20 sieverts, 40 sieverts, or whatever. So that's the unit, the sievert. My control is getting, okay, and I will show you something I'm going to. So children are about two to ten times more sensitive than adults in terms of radiation. The thyroid gland is more sensitive than adults. So we are getting to the end, so no worries. If you ask me from where we get radiation as a humans, we get radiation from different sources, including dental x-rays. So I will explain to you from where we get radiation to end with the most important part of this lecture, which is tell me what is the truth about the amount of radiation of dentistry. So we get radiation from the sun. When you are walking outside, we get radiation from the sun. If you live high in the mountains, like Denver, Colorado, you probably receive more radiation from the sun than if you live down. We also receive radiation from terrestrial sources. So we receive radiation from the soil. There is a radioactive element, radon, that is from the decay of the uranium. It's in the soil, and we breathe that. So we also receive radiation from the rain. In fact, when I moved to Kentucky and I was ready to buy a house, they told me to measure the amount of radon and put something in the basement to measure the amount of rain. So we receive radiation from the sun, from the soil. We also receive radiation from man-made sources, which is dental x-ray and medical x-ray. Now, if you think about it, man-made radiation is about 17% of the whole amount of radiation that we receive. Man-made is when you go to the physician and they want a chest x-ray, when you go to the oral surgeon and they want a panoramic film, that's about 17%. It's funny because the majority of the dental radiation comes from periapicals. Intraoral, 97% of the radi dental radiation comes from periapicals. That's the number one source of radiation in dentistry. This is the first bite wing. It took 25 minutes. And it looks better than some of the bite wings that I took in the old days in my office. <laughs> so this is the magic number. Every year, we humans living in Chicago or living in Indianapolis, every year we receive an average of 3.6 milli, millisieverts per, per year. The majority is coming from radon. Everybody sitting here. We also receive radiation from artificial radiation, man-made radiation, medical radiation and dental radiation. So if you divide 3.6 in 360 days, that will give you the amount of radiation about per day that you receive. So in the next slide, I, before I don't want to go with this for time, we are going to review the key principles of radiation protection later, but I want to show you this slide. So this is when you take a 
posterior bite wings is about half a day for radiation. That half a day is coming from 3.6 is the average radiation per year. You divide 3.6 in 360, that will give you the amount of radiation per day. So that idea that if you take a bite wing, it's like a walking 10 minutes outside, is not true. It's more than that. If you take a panoramic film, it's about one to three days of background radiation. If you take a camping CT, there are plenty of companies around here that they offer camping CT. And if you take a camping CT, the whole face, which is a big one, is about 30 days of background radiation. So, if you take an FMX, FMX is 18 radiographs using rectangular collimation. It's about four days of background radiation. And if you take that using round collimation, it's about 21 days of background radiation. I will tell you, listen this take home message. The single most effective way to decrease the amount of radiation in the dental office is using rectangular collimation. Rectangular collimation decreases the amount of radiation in one third. Something in between 35 to 45 percent. I will show you in a minute what I mean with rectangular collimation. Now, panoramic films, one to three days. One of the things that I love about, and you can, it's just next to us, the panoramic film of Earth Techniques is it offers the ability to change from a big patient to a middle size to a small patient. So you can kind of custom your panoramic film to the patient body. And the idea is to try to keep this number around one day. Some panoramic films, machines, it's about three days of background radiation. So when they take a panoramic film, it's about three days. Rectangular collimation, this is from the federal government. Rectangular collimation of the X-ray beam shall be routinely used for periapical radiographs. We dentists, we don't use that. Why we don't like to use rectangular collimation? Because if we use rectangular collimation, we need to pay more attention when we take the films. Paying more attention means that you need to use a little bit, you need to use the XCP, which is the position of the device, and you need to spend a little bit more time. So, collimation, and I will show you the one that I use. I use this. You can use that adapter with any other. If you are using round collimation, you can convert your round collimator into rectangular collimator. This is the irradiated area using round collimation, and this is the area using rectangular collimation. Only 5% of dentists in the US are using rectangular collimation. I am a dad. I will not let any dentist to make any radiograph in my girls using brown collimation. It's the single most effective way to decrease the amount of radiation. But if you decide in your office to switch to rectangular collimation, if you decide to use this, one of these adapters, and I will show you, this is the way that you can put it, then you need to retrain your staff. You need to go back to the basics because if you use rectangular collimation, the possibility to have a cone cut is high because the area is small. So you need to pay a little bit more attention. Rectangular collimation is the single most effective way to decrease the amount of radiation. We have been doing studies, all kinds of studies that shows that when you use rectangular collimation, the amount of radiation that you deliver is significantly less. Now, do we need to use thyroid color? Yes, we need to use thyroid color, always. Unfortunately, when you do panoramic films, we cannot use it because the thyroid color will interfere with the x-rays going to the patient. Here. But you're supposed to use thyroid color always, as much as you can. So I will just skip, skip this so we can go to how often we're supposed to take radiographs. 
So now you know the single most effective way, rectangular collimation. You learned that, and you can get this lecture if you want it. I will give you my email if you want to review it again. You just learned that one vitamin is, you learned that one panoramic film is not just two hours of the sun, it's more than that. You learned that. How often are you supposed to prescribe radio? The answer is patient selection criteria. The idea is you prescribe radiographs when you need it. It's not like every three months, it's not every six months, it's not every year. For some of my patients, I need to take vitamins every three months. They have decay in the clothes. I mean, I can see carriers in the shoulder. I mean, they have carriers everywhere. So if I have a patient like that, how often I will take a radiograph? Almost every day. Now, if I have a patient, good hygiene, mom and dad are in the top of the patient, open contact, no decay. How often I will take an x-ray? Maybe never. So my point is, and I think so this is the most important, and I hope that you know my colleagues someday will get the point. The point is, patient selection criteria, justification, that's the key. No every three months for everybody. No every six months for everybody. No a panoramic film every year. For some patients, maybe yes. For some patients, maybe not. Justification is the most critical point at the time to decide to take a break. Justification for the imaging. One more detail. I, and we know that, you prescribe radiographs after you look at the patient mouth, not the opposite. Sometimes some of my colleagues, they do the opposite, which is patient arrive to the office without a clinical exam, go for the radiographs. You're supposed to look first, and then you prescribe. Because looking first, you may decrease the amount of x-rays that you needed. So that's important. Patient selection criteria. Dental should not prescribe routine radiographs at preset intervals. If you have a new patient to your practice, I try to do that. I try to get the previous films. Sometimes they send me the copy of the photocopy, copy, photocopy, copy, copy, photocopy, copy. It's a black paper. So sometimes I don't have any option. I need to take a new radiograph. But I always try to get new films. I try to get the old ones. So these are the guidelines for the American Dental Association. You know, they are just guidelines. If you have a new patient, and it's a child with transitional dentition, you're supposed to do an individualized radiographic exam based on the patient needs. I would love to give you a copy of my lecture. I'm going to skip a couple of studies that I did. This is a study that I published. Some dentists, they take the first panoramic film at the age of three. How in this world you are going to take a panoramic film in a three-year-old? I mean, they barely can walk. But it's different. Now, the last five minutes. How about digital imaging? And this is what is really close to my heart. In my office at the beginning, using digital radiographs, our retake start to be over a skyrocket. You suppose, in a nice dental office like you, Dr. Ferris, you suppose to don't retake more than 10% of the x-ray that you take. If you retake 50%, it's a problem. If you retake 100%, it's a problem. I start to track the number of retakes, and I found that my office, I'm a pediatric dentist, I see 21 and younger, the number of retakes was close to 42%. That, and imagine, I am the hero of radiation safety. I was going to my home, not sleeping, not eating, well, eating a little bit, but really frustrated. Why? Because, with kids, with adolescents, it's hard to place sensors in the mouth. And I can make the case with anybody here. Sensors are challenged to be in the mouth. 
And then one day I decide to switch from sensors to phosphor plates. My life changed. Phosphor plates are a lot more welcomed by the patients. They look like the sensors. I used to believe that phosphor plates were difficult to learn how to use because obviously you need to have a processing station. So my fear was if I switch to phosphor plates, then it will take me forever waiting for the film to come to the computer. I will be waiting for an hour. I was absolutely wrong. Phosphor plates in children, people ask me all the time, Dr. J, what do you use in your office? In terms of digital radiology, I use phosphor plates. Because this is the problem. With digital radiology, it's easy to retake, correct? In the old days, retake was a lot of challenge. In the old days of normal film, you will need to go back, take the film, go back to the dark room, wait 10 minutes, but in this day, you just ah, 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 and then you ended up taking 10 films just to get one. So digital radiology is more radiation friendly, Clearly, you need less radiation, but retakes are a problem. Because at the end, maybe you are using something that is better in terms of radiation, but what's the point if to take two vitamins, you took five? So at the end, it's more radiation. So that's the problem of digital radiology. So I need to use, I need to say something that this is from my own practice. I uh, switch to phosphor plates. I use earth techniques. Uh, my staff love it. The area of the plate is bigger than the area of the sensors. That idea that will take forever to see the films on the screen is not true. Uh, in these days, there is a new one. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That is wireless. Is the I believe the Swift. So phosphor plates for a pediatric dentistry practice is an absolutely perfect match. I have been saying this for a long time. Um, uh, this is the new one, which this is wireless, so uh, that actually decreases the time. The area of the plate is bigger, uh, so you see more. It comes in the size 0, 1, 2, so it's easy for your staff to be trained in the use of the plate. You can use the conventional XCP. So I really found these systems very easy to use and radiation friendly. Clearly decreases the amount of radiation. So a perfect dental practice, rectangular collimation, rectangular collimation, a justification to take the image. And then using a system, could be sensors or phosphor plates, that minimize as much as you can the retakes. Working with the little ones, I went from sensors, high retake, to using phosphor plates. My retakes are about 10%, which is what you're supposed to have. So these are the phosphor plates. How about the handheld? There is one over there. You can walk around and you will see all this. People ask me all the time, is safe to use or not in terms of radiation? Remember I told you about the bounce back to you? About 30% of the x-ray will come back to you? Well, handheld devices like this, or like anybody, you know, I'm sure there are several here. The source of energy is batteries. They are not connected to the wall. So they use a low KB. They use a little bit lower energy to generate the X-rays. The advantage is, because it's low energy, bounce back to you, it's almost zero. So the backscatter radiation using the handheld devices is almost zero. They are safe to use. I will suggest to wear the thyroid color, but clearly, the number of x-rays hidden back to you is almost zero. And the reason is because these devices, the source of energy is batteries, so they play around with a low energy. Different from the mounted devices on the wall, 
that you connect it to the electrical outlet, which uses high energy. So that's the key about the handheld devices. So the doses for the systems are significantly less than the wall mounted devices. So they are safe to use. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, I just want to go back about a couple of things that we kind of review. We learn about radiation biology. We learn about the electromagnetic spectrum. We learn that x-rays are true. Even we don't smell, we don't feel it, but they exist. We learn that if you walk around here and somebody tells you that one panoramic film is like a walk in two minutes and looking at the sun, that's not true. We learn that we need to minimize the radiation in the dental office as much as we can. What is the most effective way? Rectangular collimation. We learn that people, only 5% of the dentists in the country are using rectangular collimation. They are afraid of retakes. And we learn that definitely phosphor plates is an ideal system to avoid an escalate number of retakes. I am not against the sensors. I use sensors in my office at the beginning with the little ones, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old. To put a sensor in the mouth is quite difficult. They can tell you that it's easy to use, but as a practitioner, I will tell you, it is a challenge. The kids will have tears. You will need to take four or five just to get one, so it's a challenge. We learned that digital radiology is less, but be careful with the retakes. And we learned that the handheld devices are kind of a good alternative. My last slide. How about CAMBIM in pediatric patients? Easy. Justification. I disagree with CAMBIM from everybody. I disagree that walking in a dental office you need to take a camping CT for every single patient. I think so there are clear justifications, third molars, pathology, swelling, that using 3D imaging is wonderful. So I'm not against camping CT. I just think that we need to use it when we have a justification. Well, I want to thank you Earth Techniques. I want to thank you, you and you. To, I will give you my email if you want to. So, um, if you want, I will put the number, the slide, the first one, so you can look at my email. So that's my email. If someday you have any questions about radiation, or if you want to know a little bit more, but please, Next time that somebody tells you one panoramic film is looking at the sun outside for one hour, it's not true. And if they ask you why, you can say whatever, I don't know, but it's not true. Because this is the problem. When we minimize the risk in that level, we give the idea that who cares? And that is wrong in my opinion. Don't think that thyroid cancer is connected with dental, but think about thyroid cancer. Think about your thyroid when you are taking all these films in your office. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you. I appreciate it.